Okay, well, I hope everyone had a wonderful long weekend. Uh, we're going to uh, get back into topic eight today. That was on microbial identification. We had spent uh, much of last lecture talking about um, microscopy. And um, I had a couple more things just to touch up on that I just kind of ran out of time with. Uh, maybe if you remember where we finished off, we were talking about fluorescence microscopy. So fluorescence microscopy is basically using special stains and those special stains, of course, are, they glow and they make some really nice images. And uh, so if you remember, I was talking about there were two types, there's kind of traditional fluorescence and then uh, you can get more and more expensive depending on the kinds of uh, technology you have, such as lasers. And that's where the confocal microscopy comes in. Though so these lasers, so you can, you can focus in at very precise uh, portions of your specimen and, and get some great images. So the, uh, there's one type of fluorescence microscopy that's really important and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit later on in today's lecture, but it is uh, the use of, uh, of uh, using immune uh, molecules called antibodies. Uh, hopefully everyone is somewhat familiar with antibodies. We are going to talk about them in topic 13 when we talk about the immune system, but uh, antibodies are immune proteins, and these are immune proteins that are, uh, are designed by your immune system to recognize things. So generally what happens is you might uh, get an infection or a vaccine, and then your body's going to make antibodies that will recognize whatever it is you're vaccinated or infected against. So let's say you get chicken pox, your body makes uh, antibodies that recognize the, uh, uh, the virus that causes chicken pox, and uh, now what you have is this molecule that uh, is, uh, is very specific to recognizing, uh, in that case, a very specific virus. So, of course, scientists are thinking about these things and they're like, you know, we have something very useful here. We have molecules that can recognize other molecules very specifically. So we could maybe use these for various diagnostic purposes. And so this is where antibodies come in and immunofluorescence. So you can see in this case here, what I'm showing is a diagram. You can see we've got an antibody that's recognizing something and we've got an antigen and that antigen could be, uh, like I said, just about anything, let's say it's a virus. So what if we want to use this antibody for some sort of diagnostic technique? And this is where immunofluorescence comes in. So in the, uh, in immunofluorescence, what we do is we take those antibodies and uh, we hire a chemist and the chemist will add a fluorescent stain to it, basically, so a fluorescent molecule. And so in this case here, you can see in this diagram, we've got uh, some antibodies and these antibodies are uh, made to recognize Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, usually we do this in an animal, so a rabbit or a goat or, a, or, or something like that. And uh, like I said, they're, they're made to, uh, uh, have a fluorescent uh, marker on them. So now these things are going to glow. So in this case here, like I said, you have a sample. You're looking to see, does this sample have the bacterium that causes Neisseria gonorrhea? And just see there's a lot of people joining late here. Uh, and so when it binds, when it binds that, uh, it con concentrates in a little portion on the microscope slide, and you have a nice bright green object where you can see your Neisseria gonorrhea or whatever it is you're trying to stain. So these antibodies, by the way, you can get, to, there's thousands of them now. There are companies that specialize in making antibodies against almost everything you could possibly imagine, all sorts of viruses and bacteria, and for all sorts of diagnostic techniques. And like I said, the nice thing about antibodies is they're very, very, very specific. So you know you're getting what you think you're getting. Uh, I think I have an uh, image here or two to show you. Uh, so there's uh, somebody who's using these uh, Neisseria gonorrhea antibodies to, you know, look at them under fluorescence and you get, like I said, these very nice images uh, and, uh, and very easy to use. So we'll come back to immunofluorescence in a bit. Uh, here's another one I found. This one is, does it say what it is? Yes. Uh, so this is looking at a Yersinia pestis, so uh, antibodies to recognize the bacteria that causes plague. So just a different way to use fluorescence. Most fluorescence, you're scanning a particular molecule, let's say DNA or something. This way you can be uh, even more, more specific. Okay, so I started making this little table here 
And uh, I'm going to come back to this table and I want to uh, basically compare some aspects of light microscopy and electron microscopy. So you can see the very first column there, light microscopy. Uh, and what does that mean? It means we're using light, right? Uh, and uh, so the light can be uh, you know, the sunlight or it can be uh, a light bulb, it could be a laser. Uh, there's lots of different options, but by light, I mean uh, either UV or visible light. Uh, so I'm not gonna fill in the electron microscopy part uh, at the moment. Like I said, I'm gonna come back to this table and uh, just use it for comparison. But I want to, at this point, just use it as a review for light microscopy. So what are we using for lenses? Uh, different materials out there, as I mentioned, the cheap ones tend to have plastic. Uh, the middle price range ones have glass and the more expensive ones are using quartz. Uh, there, are other, um, there are other mediums and even with plastic, uh, some of them are, there's cheaper plastics and more expensive plastics and so on. Uh, generally, the more expensive means you're gonna get better, uh, better resolution from your, uh, from your microscope. Uh, viewing, what does that mean? It means what are we using to view our specimen? Uh, often your eyeball, uh, you're looking at it with your eyeball, uh, you can use cameras as well. Uh, you know, nowadays in the digital era, it's very easy to use cameras, but uh, eyeballs are pretty common. Specimens are in color, yes they are, uh, and you're gonna see there's a difference with electron microscopy, things are not in color. Are they alive? Um, could be, could be dead, could be alive. Uh, some stains will kill the specimens, some stains will um, leave them alive, uh, kind of depends on your specimen and what you're looking at. So some of the techniques that we had talked about, um, I guess we didn't talk about oil immersion, uh, you can look that one up if you want, I won't be testing on that, but we talked about staining, fluorescence, confocal microscopy are some techniques. There's a whole bunch of techniques for microscopy, by the way different ways to shine the light at different angles where you, you, know, you can improve contrast and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things you can do. Uh, light microscopy is relatively cheap. Uh, like I said, you know, uh, a good microscope is less than $10,000. Uh, very easily, a, a, a decent uh, fluorescence microscope, microscope maybe $20,000. If you wanna go confocal and all that, you're, you're gonna get a lot more expensive, but that's reasonable in that uh, you know, a hospital or a lab can own one or a few of them, and it's not really gonna break the bank. I mean, it's not cheap either, but uh, if you look at what you're getting, it's not too bad. Magnification is about uh, 100 to 1,000 times, depending on which kind of lens you're using. If you're using the big uh, 100 times objective lens, uh, you're gonna get 1,000 times uh, magnification, for example. So I wanna talk a little bit about electron microscopy and uh, you know, what that is all about. And like I said, I'll come back to this table if you've missed it. And uh, there's, there's some, I wanna compare the two types of microscopy. So before we get there, uh, I do have a Kahoot for you. So you can load up the app and uh, we'll play a little game here. I think I've got eight questions. So I'll load that up and okay, here we go. So there's the pin number, I'll give everyone a minute to join. Okay, give you about 10 more seconds to join. You can join in any time if you're uh, feel a little slow. I think the pin number's on the screen at all times. Okay, here we go. Microbial identification. So it's gonna cover um, the last lecture and a little bit of this one. So question one, resolution. Okay, so it looks like a uh, majority of you got it right. So resolution is in one word, it's clarity. Uh, in more words, it's referring to the minimum distance of two distinguishable points. So if you can tell they're individual objects, uh, then it's clear. Uh, so I do have the speed ramped up on this a little bit, by the way, just giving you a warning. Uh, um, 
some of these questions are going to be more difficult than others. Okay, there's the first set of scores. Let's see if Helen can keep the lead. Question two. Helicobacter pylori is known for its connection to... Gastric ulcers, so good job if you got that. Uh, so Helicobacter pylori, by the way, uh, we were talking about microbial growth. It is something that grows really well in an acidic environment, which of course the stomach is, is acidic. Okay, question three, true or false? Gram positive bacteria stain pink and gram negative bacteria stain purple. <laughs> False. So gram positive bacteria stain purple and gram negative bacteria stain pink. I don't know where my volume is today. Usually there's some music playing. Who laces and blood agar refers to? Okay, so the answer is the rupturing of red blood cells. So hemolysis, so lysis means breaking, right? So this means the lysis of uh, red blood cells. Okay, just wondering why I have no music today. I wonder if there's something wrong with my computer. Oh well. Okay, score is getting mixed up. Some people are looking pretty hot. Question five, okay. There's a gram stain and it's asking you to identify which organism is the most plausible correct answer. Okay, so the correct answer is Streptococcus. And if you look at the image, you can see we have a streptococcus. Coccus is round little cells and strept means these little chains. And that's what you can see in the diagram. All right, next one, same thing, but it will be a different organism. Question six, identify. Okay, correct answer is E. coli. Let's take a look at the picture. Okay, I'll click on that. There's the image. Sorry, it's a little blurry, but what we have there is a gram negative rod. And so the only two gram negatives here are E. coli and Neisseria, and Neisseria is not a gram negative rod. Okay, scoreboard getting mixed up a little. Question seven, identify, there's another one. Good job, I figure I've shown you enough Staphylococcus that you should be able to get Staphylococcus. So by the way, uh, I will uh, on the midterm have at least one question like this. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be a matching question with multiple marks or whether it'll be one or two multiple choice questions. And it'll say, you know, if it was multiple choice, it would say which is the incorrect match or something like that. If it was matching, you would directly match the, uh, the image to the, to the organism. So that list that we did last day, that flow chart is important. All right, let's take a look at the scoreboard. Okay, one more question. Okay, so probably most of you figured out by default. I've already used the other organisms, so this last one must be Neisseria. Uh, this could be Neisseria gonorrhea or Neisseria meningitidis. 
Uh, what we're looking at is, is gram-negative diplococci for the most part, and you can see if you take a look at showing the little cocci, some of them are diplo, meaning there's, there's two uh, together. Okay, let's take a look at the scoreboard. See how people are doing and how awake they are on this Monday morning. So bronze for Helen and a silver for Shikina and a gold for Dylan. Yay! Look at all the confetti. Doesn't that make you excited to be uh, first place on a Monday morning? I guess it's Tuesday morning. See, that's how slow I am behind. I can't even remember what day it is. <laughs> okay. So back to our PowerPoint, and we're gonna talk about electron microscopy. So what's the whole deal behind an electron microscope? I uh, found this little picture here trying to compare what is going on, and you can see a light microscope. We have our source of illumination as light. In an electron microscope, we are not using light anymore. We're using electron beams, and uh, our lenses are made out of uh, uh, magnetic fields, and uh, you know, so there's a few different, um, a few differences there. I want to talk about two types of electron microscopy and uh, kind of talk about what's going on in both of those cases. So first one I want to talk about is called SEM, scanning electron microscopy. Uh, this here is actually the one that I use at the University of Guelph. Uh, I guess it's called a Hitachi S570. And uh, by the way, this here is the microscope. Right, so the uh, the rest of this, this here, by the way, is a computer. <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly sure when this thing was purchased. I think it was in the 1980s. So mostly the microscope is being used and then this little thing here, this is just a control panel. I still use this. And then over here, which is not shown, is just a, a normal desktop computer because it's been, it's been hooked up. These things are expensive. Um, I think at the time it was about a little less than $100,000. So a new one today would probably be double that. Uh, and uh, you know, you've got a technician that you're hiring. I think she was a half-time employee uh, to, to man this thing and to uh, train people like me who, who, you know, she trained me. It took about half a day to train me. And uh, so, you know, some serious expenses, not just buying the thing, but having people that are able to use it um, full-time was, was a big deal, right? So here are some of my images. Uh, I was looking at bacteria, so no surprise there. I kind of wished I had thrown a few other things under there that were really cool. I'll show you some cool things in a moment. You can see I've got uh, in the top left, uh, we've got uh, some normal bacteria and then everything else are some, some cells that uh, you can see I'm calling them my, my mutant babies. Uh, you know, they're not growing properly. They're growing as, as these sort of uh, bloated spheres instead of uh, rods. And, and so that, you know, was part of some of the experiments I was doing that had to deal with the, uh, the bacterial cell wall. So two things to point out here, first of all, is with scanning electron microscopes, we can't see inside things. Scanning is, is looking at the surface and you get sort of this 3D image. The other thing to point out is that uh, with these images, they are in grayscale. Uh, electrons don't come in yellow and purple and blue and orange. Electrons, you either get more electrons, so you get a brighter part of the image, or you get less electrons and you get a darker part of the image. So you can see the one I have there is blue. Uh, I added that color after. So anytime you see color with a scanning electron microscope image, it, the color was added later, uh, just to make it look pretty. There's another picture, this one, uh, just from the internet, this is E. coli. And, uh, you know, compared to that gram stain I showed you a minute ago, uh, you can see a lot more detail on these things. And you're zoomed in a lot more on electron microscopes, which is a huge advantage. We can see at a much greater magnification. Uh, there's some more, there's Giardia. You can't quite make out the nuclei, but you can see the flagella quite well. Uh, here's uh, uh, Treponema. Uh, this is, I think, the first edition of our textbook, and you can see they've added some color to try to make it a little bit more stunning or scary or whatever it was they were going for. Uh, there is uh, lots of people love to do insects, and uh, this is something I wish I had done uh, while I had access to an electron microscope. Uh, you can see insect heads are really cool looking. There's a mosquito's portrait, face only a mother could love. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this is done, and you'll see there's some uh, some parallels to uh, 
light microscopy, and then some things that are different, obviously. Uh, so here's the sample preparation. So there's my little sample. Uh, this is not mine. This is somebody doing a mosquito. You can see maybe the mosquito there on the end of some forceps. And uh, then what happens is the sample is put into this thing is called a sputter coater. I don't know how it works. Basically, you stick your sample in, you press the button, and you come back two minutes later. What it does is it coats the specimen with a very thin layer of gold. So maybe you can see now that the specimen is just a little more shiny. Uh, why do we use gold? It's kind of like staining, right? So gold is a heavy metal, meaning it has lots of electrons. And if you want to see things with electron microscope, having electron dense samples is good. So sometimes we use gold. You can use platinum. Platinum is more expensive than gold. Uh, kind of depends on the technique. But for SEM, gold is pretty common. It's cheaper than platinum and, uh, and it works really well. So then it goes into the microscope and uh, you can see that we have actually a vacuum chamber there and uh, we put things under vacuum because air itself has electrons in it so we're trying to minimize any background noise we want a nice clear sharp image and then the uh, picture you probably saw before uh, the top thing is an electron gun where it shoots these beams of electrons at the sample you stick it in there and then there's knobs where you can focus and zoom and all that and so you can see here is a Here's an image of the, uh, uh, the mosquito's eyeball. We can zoom in quite a bit with a scanning electron microscope, zooming into one of those hairs. You'd never be able to see this kind of detail under a light microscope. Uh, in those hairs, we can zoom in even more and more. In fact, in this image here, we can actually see individual proteins being used to make up that hair, which is just really incredible uh, to think that we can see individual proteins. So pretty cool stuff and uh, lots of really nice images out there. I'll show you a few more. I've got a whole bunch for you to show you. I think I showed you this one before of the hookworm. This one here, just every time I see that image, it's, it's terrifying. Uh, there's a tick. Like I said, insects are very interesting under scanning electron microscopes. There's a tapeworm at the bottom. And, uh, you know, uh, you can see lots of details that you've never been able to see before. So there's some, some chromosomes, so uh, you know that's pretty cool. You can see chromosomes under a light microscope, but look at the detail there, just, just stunning. Uh, like I said, we can add color, and uh, the, uh, the thing about electron microscopes is we can see things we haven't seen before, like viruses. So for example, viruses were discovered, uh, we kind of had an idea that there was something that was small and filterable way back. Uh, about 100 years ago, but it wasn't until really the 19, late 1930s where we had electron microscopes where we could see viruses for the first time. You need an electron microscope to see viruses. So if you want to see a virus, uh, you have to buy one of these things. Now, most hospitals do not have a scanning electron microscope. You'd have to pay a full-time technician and all that. Uh, but research and larger hospitals do. Uh, and sometimes they're trying to look at these samples. Uh, for example, when there's the Ebola outbreak, uh, everyone wants to see, you know, what they're looking at. And so you can see there on, on, the, on the right, there's a picture of uh, the Ebola virus and they've added some color so you can see the viral particles quite well. And, uh, and like I said, uh, this is something you'd never be able to see under a light microscope. So nice colors, like I said, lots of pictures. It's hard for me to not just include too many pictures of these things because they're very, very nice to look at. Uh, there's another one there. Again, the color is really helping to see this. If you look at this image under grayscale, it's, it's actually a lot harder to see the viral particles. This is uh, HIV budding off of uh, an infected cell. And then, you know, of course, there's people who get kind of artsy. This one's called salt and pepper. Uh, this was, uh, I think, a National Geographic uh, photography contest. And you can see you've got a salt crystal. And uh, I don't know if that's a pollen from pepper or peppercorn. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but very, very cool. So there's a second type of electron microscopy I want to talk about, and this is called TEM, or transmission electron microscopy. So in this case here, it's a little different from SEM. The SEM, the electrons hit the sample, and they bounce off, and then they are measured by a detector. Uh, by the way, we don't, uh, we don't look at these things with our eyeballs. You don't want a high energy intense beam shooting at your face. Uh, you know, these are usually, uh, the images are, are measured by either in the old days, it would be uh, photography paper uh, or x-ray paper or something like that. Nowadays we have detectors and we, we can read digital images uh, pretty easily as well. 
So in this case, the electrons transmit, so they go right through a sample. And uh, so the samples have to be very thin. And actually this will destroy the samples after you know, a few shots of the electron beam. So it's, uh, it's a little bit harder to do and the technicians are more expensive to hire, unfortunately. You can see in this case here, it's measuring also measure uh, stained with heavy metals. And again, depending on what object you're trying to uh, stain or you're trying to stain the, the membrane or the DNA, you might use different types of metals. So I did have a chance to use a transmission electron microscope. There's my image. Uh, this was an interesting experience because uh, it was kind of a one-off. And so I didn't do most of the work. I kind of had a guy standing there and I did some parts and he did some parts. He was a little impatient with me. And, and it took like a week to get my samples ready. And then when I came to use the transmission electron microscope, I wasn't allowed to touch it. <laughs> you know, I mean, this was when I was a grad student and if I was only using it once, it wasn't worth his time to train me, uh, is, is really the reality of it. My, my pictures kind of turned out sort of okay, not really what I was looking for. So I, I just moved on. I didn't feel like it was worth the time to kind of go back and try to get better pictures for this. But there they are. I thought I'd share them with you, but you can see the inside this time of the cells. Uh, which is great because now we can look at things like organelles. We can see in this in this diagram here you can see uh, the, uh, the chromosomes, the nucleoid regions. You can see around the, the surface of this one. This one looks like it has a capsule. You can see the uh, the loose carbohydrates on the edge. Uh, so again, a lot more detail than you'd ever see under a gram stain or a traditional uh, light microscope. Uh, there's another picture you can see this is uh, looks like an animal cell and you can see all sorts of objects in there you can see endoplasmic reticulum you can see the nucleus is that big circle in the in the in the middle uh the circle within the nucleus so this thing here that's the nucleolus uh a lot of those uh, uh circles all around those are ribosomes so some amazing details of course color is even better so often you see in particularly in textbooks and other publications people are adding color because they want to have things pop out and highlight all the details there. So pretty cool stuff. Of course, like I said, we're always interested in viruses and uh, every time there's a new virus that pops out, uh, that's one of the first things that everyone wants and the news media wants. You know, that new H1N1 virus, you know, what does it look like? And this was, so this was one of the first official images, for example, of the H1N1 virus uh, 11 years ago. Uh, there's herpes simplex virus. Again, you can make up some, some amazing details. Okay, so we had light microscopy, right? Uh, you're getting about that much detail for bacteria. Scanning electron microscope, you're getting surface kind of 3D type images. And then a uh, transmission electron microscope, you're starting to be able to see inside uh, for eukaryotes, you might see organelles, but you can see cell walls and, and membranes and lots of cool things. So there's just another, another image. You can see kind of the same magnification for two different samples, and you're definitely getting sharper image with the scanning electron microscope. Okay, so back to this uh, table here. Like I said, I just wanted to kind of compare these things a little bit and then move on. Uh, so electron microscope uses electron beams, and for the lenses, it uses magnetic fields. I mentioned that we're not using our eyeball anymore. It's usually uh, some sort of a photographic paper for older microscopes, and uh, often there are digital uh, readers that, that will convert the uh, images into uh, some sort of digital photograph uh, that you can look at on a computer. Electron microscopes. Images are not in color, they're in grayscale. The color is added afterwards, it's artificial. Specimens are always dead. Uh, you know, if you think about it, you're dehydrating these specimens, you're, you're coating them with uh, often toxic heavy metals, uh, you're killing these things for sure. Lots of techniques again for electron microscopy. Uh, in this case, uh, we we're just talking about SEM and TEM. There are other techniques as well. Most of them fall into one of those categories or they're kind of close. For those categories, but uh, uh, those two you should know. Um, electron microscopes are expensive. Uh, for a transmission electron microscope, uh, a lot of them run half a million dollars. And like I said, you've got expensive technicians to pay as well and uh, a lot more extensive training. So for magnification, a light microscope, we're looking at up to about a thousand times. Uh, we can actually improve that 
uh, with fluorescence nowadays and uh, you know expensive software packages to maybe 2,000, maybe 3,000 times, but really about 1,000 times is, one, is sort of an upper limit that's usually considered practical for most, uh, most uh, technicians and, and people working in labs. Uh, for scanning electron microscope up to 250,000 times and a transmission electron microscope up to a million times. So like I said, you can zoom in and you can actually see membranes, not really detailed in membranes because uh, they are very, very skinny things, but you can imagine all the details you can see in organelles and other structures. So they're, they're pretty cool. Okay, I'm gonna move on from this. Um, you can always uh, check out the video later if, you, if you've missed anything. I uh, wanted to show you a couple other things. Uh, I found this on the internet. Uh, you know, if you are looking to get into the transmission electron microscope business, you can buy one of these. Uh, this is supposed to be the biggest and most powerful transmission electron microscope out there. And uh, let me just point out a couple of things. These here, that's a railing. This thing is like three stories high. It is just incredible. I don't know how much it costs. You probably have to call them for a quote. There's a guy there working in it. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is a researcher or a technician, but he's probably getting paid some big bucks. Uh, you know, some of these people, uh, there's a lot of techniques for transmission electron microscopy that, uh, you know, there's only a handful of people in the world that can get these images. And um, so, uh, you know, not, not a huge demand all the time, but, uh, you know, these people are very specialized technicians. And uh, so they get paid a little bit better than, than most electron microscope technicians. Okay, so I do want to talk about one other kind of microscopy, which is kind of newish, uh, and it's really cool. It's not gonna be on the test, but I just wanted to show it to you because it's just really neat. And uh, we're, we're probably in the future gonna get a bit more use out of this. Uh, at the moment, this is mostly research and niche and kind of just, you know, for interest, but for, uh, for biology, like I said, it's gonna be more and more useful over time. Uh, so this is called scanning probe microscopy. So what does that mean? Uh, you can think of this as, uh, rather than using light or an illumination source, uh, think of it like how a blind person would, uh, would, would understand around something. So a blind person would, of course, you know, they would feel something. What do I have here? This is a wall. This here is a tree. Here we have a dog. And so they're using their fingers to, you know, touch whatever it is and, and uh, figure out what it is. So this is more systematic. This is a scanning system. So the, um, rather than thinking all, you know, a person's fingers and feeling, you know, is this a dog or an elephant, uh, you're, you're gonna scan it. So there's a little probe, kind of like a little finger. You can see that image on the left. It just sort of goes back and forth, right? And just a little bit and it can feel the contour. So you can imagine on my desk here, right? I'm gonna go back and forth. I have a smooth part. This is the desks, uh, more desk, more desk. And eventually I'm feeling some bumps. Here's my uh, keyboard, okay? And then there's, uh, okay, there's the trackpad and so on. And so what it does is it takes that information. Again, you've got some software and it's gonna convert this into a, a 3D image. Uh, so up until about 10-ish uh, years ago, if you wanted one of these things, you had to build it yourself. They're actually invented in the 1980s, but most people didn't actually use them until about 20 years ago because you had to build one yourself. But 10 years ago, there were some commercial ones on the market now. And so it's, it's getting a lot more use. There's different types of probe microscopy. You can see they have, all have different acronyms. This one's called atomic force microscopy, uh, and it's a type of probe microscopy. And you can see the look on E. coli, and you can see the flagella on there. Um, there's some weird bumps. Uh, this is hard on the samples. If you have a hard sample, if you're looking at a metal surface, you can get some amazing images. Uh, but if you're looking at biological specimens, they tend to be a lot more squishy. So uh, sometimes they end up being kind of warped, but uh, this is one of the nicer ones I've seen. It's really a very, very nice image. Again, the color is added afterwards. Uh, here's some other ones. We can actually get down and we can see viruses. So there's a herpes simplex virus. You can see the capsid proteins on the surface there, those little lumps. Uh, there's another image of E. coli. Not a lot out there, uh, but it's starting to increase as, as these things are, people are finding more use for them and as the prices are going down. I thought this is a really cool one. Uh, you can see there's the uh, image of uh, just computer generated image on the left of the DNA double helix. And they have gone and you, and, and you can see the actual image on the right using uh, atomic force microscopy. And you can actually make out the helix. 
It's not perfect. You can see as it's dragging back and forth, the sample is wobbling and you're getting some, some noise, but uh, really incredible. I don't even know how they did that. It's just really amazing image. Okay, so that's kind of the end of our microscopy, uh, but uh, there are a few other things to kind of round off this topic that fall into the whole category of identifying microorganisms. Uh, so we already talked about antibodies. I want to come back. There are other ways to use antibodies rather than just microscopy. So like I said, antibodies are proteins made by the immune system, and they are designed specifically to recognize something. So in the case of our immune system, we're trying to recognize infections. In the case of uh, diagnostic purposes, uh, we can make antibodies towards quite a bunch of different things. Now for medicine, of course, we're making antibodies usually against uh, uh, some sort of antigen that you'd find on a pathogen. So it could be a glycoprotein on a virus. It could be a carbohydrate found on a uh, streptococcus. Uh, basically any molecule you want, we can often make an antibody against it. And like I said, there are companies that do this all over uh, the place and have thousands that you can buy from them. So you can call this immunological characterization, or often an older term we might use is serological, right? And, and it kind of means the same thing uh, in terms of molecules made by the immune system. So I want to show you some techniques. We talked about the fluorescence microscopy. Like I said, in fluorescence microscopy, what you have is this little antibody. So there's a little antibody, and you have a fluorescent um, molecule that's been attached to it by a chemist. And then the antibody is going to recognize some sort of, you know, let's, there's my little virus or whatever that is. And so the antibodies uh, congregate and, and then they show up uh, as a nice uh, image that can be seen on a fluorescence microscope. And so here's a case where we've got, uh, it looks like a patient is being tested for plasmodium. So this is probably a blood smear uh, looking for malaria. And you can see uh, the pathogens uh, show up quite well. Not a lot of detail there, but you can make up the pathogens, which in many cases, that's the whole idea. We're looking for a positive or a negative diagnosis. And with fluorescence, we can get some really nice, uh, nice images. Uh, there's another one on the, on the left of uh, looking for the measles antibody. Uh, so sometimes we're not necessarily detecting the virus or the bacterium or the pathogen. Sometimes we're actually looking for does somebody's body make an immune response. In this case, the person is actually testing for, did they have an immune response against measles? Uh, so detecting human antibodies in that case. Uh, there's another one on the right, looks like uh, uh, looking for rabies virus as well. So these viruses, you can't see them with a light microscope, but we can stain them with fluorescence antibodies so that we can, we can read a signal, which is really cool. So another technique that is used using antibodies is something called agglutination. So what does agglutination mean? It means clumping. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some images how this clumping works, but often uh, this is very simple. It's usually done on a, like a glass microscope slide or something like that, and you're gonna have a, a sample. It could be blood uh, or some sort of other bodily fluid, and the uh, antibody solution is added and this happens relatively quickly, within a minute or two, and the clumping is very visible uh, just with the naked eye. So how does agglutination work? Uh, there's different ways to have agglutination. Pretty common way to do agglutination is called latex agglutination. So you can see latex is, of course, uh, basically a type of plastic, and uh, you attach a bunch of, um, of antibody molecules to it, right? So why do we do this? Why do we attach them to that? Because we're, we're trying to make clumps and we're trying to do it quickly. And so if you have lots of antibodies together, it's kind of like multitasking and the whole process just happens a little, little more quickly. Uh, and that's what the latex is for. So there's those antibodies. We could be testing for all sorts of things. Like I said, just depends on what those antibodies are. Uh, they're added using a little bit of chemistry to the latex and it's gonna uh, bond covalently. And then you add your, your specimen. As you can see, there's some, it looks like some little bacteria of some sort. And uh, so when you have all those multiple little antibodies, it's kind of like multiple hands uh, and uh, these, they can grab all those antigens and you end up with, uh, you know, this big clump. 
and the clump is visible on, with the naked eye, right? So like I said, relatively simple process. Uh, you just add the solution uh, of the latex uh, uh, covalently bound antibodies. Uh, you know, you can buy a whole bunch of these nowadays. There are companies specialize in making these and you add it to the, uh, the sample and look for the clumping. So here's an example of a sample looking at uh, a streptococcus. And uh, I know it's kind of hard to tell on this image. So I have a zoom in here in a moment. And uh, I just wanted to point out that this is streptococcus pyogenes, which is a group A strep, right? So I want to talk about that in a moment. Here's the zoom in. And so you can see the positive result. Uh, in that case, you've got the clumping, you know, sometimes maybe you need a magnifying glass or microscope, but not a big deal. But you can see there's definitely a clear difference between the uh, agglutinated version with the clumping and the, uh, the, the non-agglutinated version. So let's go back to strep for a minute, right? Uh, it's not important that you know all about this group A, group B. Uh, you can see there's a whole bunch of groups of strep, right? It goes all the way down to R and S, as far as I could tell. Um, the two in red, those two organisms you need to know for this class. So you need to know Streptococcus pyogenes. Okay, so we talked about this being as beta hemolytic. And uh, so this organism here is, is associated with uh, tonsillitis and strep throat and, and a whole bunch of other infections. Uh, it can infect other body parts, uh, but uh, usually we're thinking about, like I said, strep throat or tonsillitis or something like that. Uh, streptococcus pneumonia is the other one to know. Remember, it's alpha hemolytic and associated with pneumonia, but can cause other infections. So what's this group A, B, C, and D, and all this stuff all about? Uh, so there was a guy, his name was Lansfield, and he was characterizing different streptococcus organisms using serology, so using different antibodies. And so he classified them into groups. And I think even after Lansfield did his initial study, there were other people that went along and, and, and added more groups all the way to S apparently. And uh, anyway, the name stuck, Lansfield groups. Uh, for whatever reason, he didn't characterize Streptococcus pneumonia. So I don't know why that is, but it's considered a non-Lansfield Streptococcus. So this, this terminology, this serological characterization terminology still has stuck to the point where we still talk about these things. You know, we talk about group A strep and group B strep. And those ones are important. We're not really going to cover group B strep uh, in this class here. Um, but uh, if, you've had, um, if you've been pregnant and had a baby, this is something they test you for because uh, group B strep can be found uh, associated with the genitals and as, as well the vagina and uh, it's not good for babies. Uh, it can cause uh, uh, serious disease and, and death in babies. So if, if you've been group B strep positive, uh, then they might give you antibiotics before you have your, before you have your, your childbirth, uh, just as a precaution. Uh, so it is a significant medi medically or uh, significant organism, but we're just, like I said, you can't cover everything in one class, so we're not really going to talk about it too much in this, in this course. Uh, you can see it's similar to Streptococcus pyogenes, it's beta hemolytic, uh, just has different surface antigens. Uh, so in this case, it's carbohydrates on the surface that are making it recognized differently by the immune system and, of course, by Lansfield in his initial study. Okay, so there's, there's just a diagram here, right? And you can see that uh, what we have are some different samples. Uh, and this is, uh, looks like it's spinal fluid and uh, they're testing uh, for Lansfield antigens. And you can see in this case here, the B group Lansfield antigens were recognized in sample two. And you can see the clumping. So here's another one. Uh, like I said, it doesn't just have to be streptococcus. There are uh, agglutination tests for Staphylococcus aureus, for example. In this case here, you can see uh, there's these antibodies and they are binding to a specific protein on Staphylococcus aureus called protein A. I don't know what protein A does, uh, but it must be a surface antigen and somebody decided it was a good thing to make antibodies against to uh, uh, study, look at it for this agglutination test. So there is another way to do agglutination tests uh, as well. Uh, and this is kind of the opposite test where you still have latex beads 
But in this case here, uh, you have the antigen on there. So like I said, in many cases, what we're trying to do is see, does has somebody been exposed to that virus? Have they had an immune response? And viruses, uh, you know, like say you had the infection two weeks ago, right? That means your immune system has probably cleared off the virus. There's going to be very little or probably no virus left in your blood. So how do we test for that? Well, we test for, does the person have antibodies in their blood? So you get the antigen. So this could be a viral spike protein. It can be attached to latex. And this is kind of the opposite idea, but really the same idea is, is you, have, uh, you have an antigen, an antibody, they bind together and then they clump. And we can look for that clumping. And so we can say, yes, the person has a positive immune reaction to such and such an antigen. Uh, they've probably been infected in the last little while. So similar idea, uh, like I said, just wanted to show you that it's slightly different. Uh, you probably uh, have seen this kind of thing done somewhere or you've heard about it. Uh, back in the day when I went to high school, this was something that, uh, that uh, we did in grade 11. I don't think they're allowed to do this anymore. Uh, generally, uh, uh, you're, you're not allowed to test students um, or take uh, samples uh, of, their, of their bodily fluids anymore. Uh, in this case, like we did it on our own, we had to prick our finger and put a little bit on a microscope slide and do an agglutination test for blood typing. Uh, and, uh, but like I said, they're not really allowed to do this anymore, particularly with blood and concerns around things like HIV. And uh, well, and with blood typing, you wouldn't want you know, to find out that uh, the child was adopted and didn't know it or, or something like that, I'm sure are, are lots of issues, right? Uh, but in this case here, uh, for blood typing, we're looking for the A and B antigens, right? So we have uh, uh, the blood. Uh, we don't need latex in this case because we have these giant red blood cells and they have antigens on them. And these are carbohydrates representing A and B uh, carbohydrates. And uh, so you throw the antibodies in and you can look for the clumping. So I'll show you a test here for the ABO blood typing and how that works. And uh, so there's two types of antigens. There's the A. And that's a uh, carbohydrate arrangement, and there's the B. So if you take a look at the diagram here, uh, well, why don't we just take a look at here first? A, you can start, that's a good place to start. And you get two drops of blood. You put the A antibodies. If you get the A antibodies, you get clumping, and this is A type blood. And there should be no clumping with the B antibodies. You're going to see the opposite here with the B type group. It's going to clump with the B antibodies and no clumping with the A-type antibodies. If you are somebody who has type AB blood right here, you're gonna get clumping with both the A antibodies and the B antibodies. And if you have O-type blood, you're missing those antigens entirely, and so there's gonna be no clumping. So this is a very quick test to do, uh, and uh, it's done all the time. And uh, you know it helps figure out you know, what kind of blood this person needs if they need a transfusion or for other uh, other medical procedures, and it's just agglutination. Sometimes we call it heme agglutination to represent the fact that we're looking at uh, red blood cells. Okay, so there's another test I want to tell you about that is, uh, is really important that is also using antibodies, and this is called an ELISA. So you can see it has a big long name here, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. So what does that mean? Enzyme linked, we'll get to that in a minute. Immuno, that means we're dealing with antibodies. Sorbent means we're absorbing something. Assay, this means a test. So for ELISA, I don't want you to worry about all the details of the test, but you should know what it is. Kind of know a definition of what it is and what it's testing. But I'll show you how it works anyway. And uh, I'll show you all, these, uh, uh, all the steps to it and I'll come, come back to the slide in a minute. Usually these are done in some sort of micro plate. You can see that's a 96 well plate, so I can test 96 samples all at once. And, uh, and so that's convenient as well. And in fact, there are instruments that will read these, uh, read these results as well. So here's what you have. This is representing one little well, and uh, it's a special plastic that will bind, um, bind proteins and, and other compounds, right? So what do you do? You put the sample in there. The sample could be blood, it could be saliva, uh, you know, a variety of other different uh, specimens. And it will stick to the plastic covalently. It usually gets washed. And then what do you do? You look for it. So 
This could be a test for, let's say, HIV. You put the blood sample in there, and then you throw in a specific antibody, an antibody looking for HIV. And uh, it gets washed. There's always washing in these steps. Things are always more complicated than, the, than they look. So, sorry, I'll just go back for a second. So at this point, we have an antibody, and if you are HIV positive, the antibody will bind to the protein there. If you are not, there's no binding at all. But at this point, we can't see anything. We've got these microscopic proteins, so no good. So what they do is they throw in a second antibody in there. And so this uh, first antibody here, uh, you know, is recognizing the virus or whatever the antigen is. The second antibody, notice it says it's enzyme linked. So this one is recognizing the first one. I know it sounds complicated. Why didn't we just, you know, add an enzyme to the first one? Well, you know what? All these lab technicians, they're not chemists, right? Uh, we, we could do that. Um, but it's just, it's a lot more complicated. This is actually easier. You have something that recognizes the first antibody and has an enzyme to it. And what's the enzyme all about? Well, the enzyme is going to help us to see it. So what you do is you put a substrate in there, and the substrate will turn colored by that enzyme. So there's all sorts of compounds out there when, you, when uh, there are enzymes that will break them down, and they start off as one color, and they turn to a second color. So you can see in this case here, it's turning to yellow with the enzyme. So if you get a yellow color, it means that all of these things have happened, that an antibody has recognized an antigen, right? That's really all we need to know. Something has been recognized in that sample, and the something is what we're looking for. So there's, a, there's a, an, an image of, of a plate. You can see you have some blanks. So, you know, some of the blanks you want to just add water to make sure that it's not getting any false positives. You have some controls, negative controls and positive controls, just to make sure everything is working out. And then you've got a, a whole bunch of plate, uh, uh, samples there looking at, uh, you know, whether people are positive or negative. So notice I do have in the notes here, we are, can look for an antigen. So you can look for the actual virus. Or maybe, I, uh, sorry if I misled you, with HIV, we're not actually looking for the virus because it's usually found as small numbers in the blood. We're actually looking for antibodies against the HIV virus. And uh, to look that somebody is trying to mount an immune response against HIV. And so there's kind of a summary diagram showing that, hey, what you're doing is trying to look for an antigen or antibody, and you have a colored reaction that is detecting it. So the color is not from the byproduct of metabolism. The color is from whatever substrate you're using. And there's different substrates. This one is just happens to be yellow. Uh, I've used this uh, kind of technique before. I'm just trying to remember. I think I used one that turned blue or purple. And I had another one that actually was fluorescent. Uh, so there's different reactions you can get. It kind of just depends on what company uh, and protocol you're working with. So, um, there are these rapid tests out there, and maybe you've seen this kind of thing if you've ever taken a pregnancy test, but the, the pregnancy test is not the only kind of rapid test out there. Uh, these are a type of ELISA, and uh, here's an, an HIV rapid test. And if you take a look here, basically what you have is uh, a place where the sample is going to go with the HIV test. I believe it's uh, going to be blood again. And with a pregnancy test, for example, it's, it's urine. And uh, so the sample goes in there and diffuses uh, within this little cartridge. And I'll show you a video here in a moment uh, how this works. Uh, but as it diffuses through the cartridge, uh, eventually, you know, if there's antigens in there that, need to, that are going to be recognized, they bind to antibodies, and then they stick to certain parts on the strip and cause these little bands. So all of these things have a control band. So if the control does not light up, then the test is invalid. So you can see that's why uh, this one here, there's no control and no control, so it doesn't light up at all. And then there's the two possibilities, assuming the test work out, it's positive if you have two bands and negative if you have one. So uh, somebody's asking, are the companies that make these tests regulated? Um, for medical tests, yes. Off the shelf tests, I would imagine so. I'm not entirely sure. Anything that's used by a clinic or hospital, uh, these kind of tests are regulated. And that was actually a big kerfuffle in the States, in fact, with all the testing and why the Americans were so far behind with all the testing uh, with COVID-19, because uh, they just, they have a certain system for, for getting their tests approved, and they went their own route. They didn't want to use the test. For some reason, they decided to devise their own test that wasn't uh, Regulated that wasn't recommended by the World Health Organization, and, and of course their test didn't actually turn out to be as good. And uh, 
so it was, it was a little bit slower there uh, getting getting these things ramped up. I'm, I'm sure there were political reasons as well uh, that had to do with the testing, but that was a big issue in the, in, in the states, at least in the first month or two of the pandemic. So I have a video here uh, and I'm going to play this for you. I'm hoping we have some volume. Maybe I, I wonder if I have that. I don't even know how to turn it on. I don't have volume. Uh, but this is, uh, oh, why can't I get that? Oh, there it is. I'll play that for you in a second. Um, I'm just going to uh, switch to the web browser. But like I said, there's a whole bunch of tests that use these rapid uh, systems. So I'll just switch here to, there we go. Okay, I'll play this for you and hopefully we get some volume. Okay, sorry, no volume. Um, it says my speakers are muted. I don't know how to unmute them. There's no, there's no button for them. So I'll probably have to restart my computer. So what it's telling you is that when you're pregnant, uh, when the egg gets fertilized and, the, uh, and, and planted, it produces a certain protein. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, there's the acronym for it though, HCG. And uh, so, you know, that's what's gonna be detected in the urine, right? And uh, so there's the urine, it's put into the, into the little strip and uh, what they're trying to show, they're gonna zoom in and show what's going on. You've got the liquid diffusing and uh, something in the liquid of course is that protein or antigen or whatever it is you're looking for. And it's going across and it's getting captured by those uh, antibodies. So those antibodies are sitting there and they're just waiting for whatever it is you're looking for, whether it's HIV in an HIV sample or whether it's the protein in the, in the pregnancy test. And uh, within the test, like I said, there's a, a, uh, um, a positive control. And so you're gonna get a band if, it, if the test works and uh, the second band if you're positive. So somebody's asking, are the dipsticks basically the same thing? Yeah, they're basically the same thing. Yeah, and like I said, they're just probably the most commonly uh, uh, known one because people are a little more, more are experienced or at least have, have seen them somewhere before, whether it's on, on a movie or use them uh, personally. But uh, there's a whole bunch of these rapid tests now. Like I said, the ones for uh, HIV have been really important. Uh, and the reason why that is, is because these ELISA tests, traditional ELISA tests, you're looking at a day or two to get a technician to do it. And uh, with these rapid HIV tests, uh, so there's the rapid HIV test there. Uh, it takes 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something like that, and you're getting a result. Now, they're not perfect. These tend to have a lot more uh, errors to them. They're maybe 95% accurate. So that means for HIV, you're gonna get one in 20 people who are gonna get the wrong result. And that's not good. But the advantage of them is with something like HIV, you do have uh, at-risk populations coming in to get these tests, right? So let's say uh, uh, sex workers or, or drug users, intravenous drug users, and uh, they're less likely to come back, you know, when they say, okay, can you come back on Thursday to get the results of your test? Uh, they're just less likely to come back. So it's nice to have these rapid tests so you can help the person out and, and uh, give them some answers uh, right away. Okay, so that's enough for serological stuff for now. I wanna talk about genetic characterization because uh, this is getting to be really, really common for a lot of things. So if you've had to get a COVID test, uh, this is usually what they're looking for. In fact, they're looking for uh, viral RNA. And I wanna show you how this works a little bit. Uh, the, uh, uh, the thing that they're doing is something called polymerase chain reaction. So really it's a DNA polymerase that we're using or in some cases an RNA polymerase, but it doesn't really matter. Your polymerase is making more copies of that nucleic acid. And uh, so the idea is, you know, uh, when you get a, let's say a SARS-CoV-2 test, uh, you know, there might be viral particles at the back of your throat somewhere, right? Uh, well, if you take a swab, are you gonna see them? No. So what we wanna do is we wanna make many copies, like millions of copies of that, so that we can positively identify what it is we're looking for. Uh, you can see on the right here, this was uh, invented by this guy, Kerry Mullis. Uh, haven't read his book yet, but uh, apparently it's really interesting because uh, apparently he came up with this idea 
uh, while driving along the coast of California. And he talks a little bit about science and he was talking a little bit about some of the drugs he's using. Uh, so maybe, maybe some inspiration there. And this is the kind of thing though that uh, is so simple. So many people look at it and they're like, why didn't I think of that? So if you know a little bit about DNA polymerization in a cell, uh, there's a whole bunch of things involved, a bunch of enzymes and whatnot. And so his idea was, well, why don't we figure out how to do this in the test tube? So you can see what's going on. You do not need to know the steps of PCR, but you should, like Eliza, know what it is and what it's used to test for. So take a look at this. What's going on is you have a double-stranded uh, uh, molecule of DNA and you melt it apart. So rather than doing this enzymatically, you can melt it, bring the temperature up to 95 degrees or so, and uh, then what you do is you throw these primers in here. So these primers are little complementary sequences looking for whatever it is you're looking for. So you might have a sequence for SARS-CoV-2, you might have a sequence for HIV, and it's going to bind with base pairing to those template original molecules. Then you throw in your polymerase, so this is a DNA polymerase, and it makes another strand of DNA. So now we went from one strand to two strands. You do this again and again and again. So after cycle two, you have four strands. After cycle three, you have eight strands, and then 16 and 32. You do this like 30 times, you're gonna have millions of strands. So, you know, if you have some time, go on your calculator, go two times two times two and do that 30 times. You'll see it, it turns out to be like more than a million. Uh, and so you go from one molecule of nucleic acid to many. And so you can find what you're looking for. Many applications of this. Uh, you've probably seen some sort of crime show or movie. We're always doing DNA testing. You know, they find a, a hair, a single hair in a crime scene or a blood or a semen sample or something like that. And, uh, you know, you're trying to match it to a suspect. There's lots of research. There's lots of cool stuff going on nowadays with, uh, you know, they found uh, woolly mammoth hair, for example, and studying the genome and whatnot. And then of course, this last one is what is important for this class, is that we can use this to detect pathogens. So a lot of viruses now, we're starting to move in this route uh, because it, is, uh, it may be cumbersome, uh, but it gives you a really accurate test, right? So SARS-CoV-2, there are some serological quick tests, but they're not as accurate. Uh, and they're looking for, an, you know, and when you're looking for early on in the infection, you are looking for presence of the actual virus. Uh, some organisms, chlamydia, we cannot grow chlamydia in a lab. So how do you test for it? Well, we use a, D, a DNA test. Uh, tuberculosis as well is very slow growing, so there are DNA tests for it, although that's not necessarily the standard test for tuberculosis. Uh, I'll just show you a couple of things for interest. Uh, you can see uh, I mentioned it was used for crime scenes or paternity testing. So if you take a look at this, this is a, a, a paternity test, right? So finding out, okay, is this the, the real father, for example? And so you can see here, we've got a mom, we've got a father, we've got two children. And uh, so mom's DNA should, she's contributing half the DNA and dad is contributing the other half of the DNA. So if you look at this, you know, the mom is put on this control. We have all these bands. They basically line up and they're about half the bands. It looks like that's the right mom. And then dad, half of his DNA should line up with the kids. And maybe not the same bands for each child. Like child number one has that band that matches with dad, but not child number two and so on. I'll show you an example here how this might work. Like I said, mostly just for fun. So you can see it says here, which of these children are the biological offspring of the father? So the father is right here. Right there, and so with each child, what you're doing is basically looking to see does half the DNA match. So uh, there's not a lot of bands here. This is a very simple one, but you can take a look. So child four, yes. Child two, yes. Let's see here, child three, this band here matches. Child one, okay, looks good. All right, so in good shape here. Looks like we do have the right dad. So that's always a good thing. Okay. So I have a case study here for you. Uh, so we have a 17 year old female it says she's nauseated and she's weak. She uh, within a few hours her condition deteriorated, she began with a fever, nausea, confusion, stiff neck and a rash on her extremities. Um, so at this point, probably most physicians would suspect something already. 
um, you know, with the, that particular set of symptoms. But let, let's read this a little further and, and see what it's talking about. The time she's saying the ER, the rash appeared as large purple blotches. She was barely conscious. They took blood samples uh, and uh, gave her antibiotics. And uh, interestingly, the same evening, another teenager was admitted with stiff neck and fever. They also sampled his spinal fluid and later revealed that the two patients actually knew each other. They attended a New Year's party. And so if you take a look, we've got gram-negative diplococci again. So last time it was gonorrhea, this time it is not gonorrhea. This time it is a different Neisseria, Neisseria meningitidis. So it's right in the name that this is classic signs of bacterial meningitis. You can see you've got fever, nausea, confusion. We've got infection of the, of the nervous system. And then Neisseria meningitidis, uh, I'm not sure the mechanism behind it, but often there is a rash uh, and uh, these, these purplish blotchy rashes that, that show up on patients. So there's some questions here. I know we haven't talked about Neisseria meningitidis a lot, so now is a good time to talk about it. It says, how is it spread? So it turns out that Neisseria meningitidis is found um, on many of us. Uh, it can be considered part of the normal flora. Uh, and uh, so, um, but it can also be spread uh, through droplets, so respiratory droplets, uh, for example. And you may have noticed uh, in, the, uh, in the description, it's talking about a New Year's party, right? And uh, so, uh, you know, what's going on at New Year's parties? Well, in, in, in some places in New Year's parties, uh, there's kissing going on, right? You know, you kiss people at midnight, for example, right? And of course, teenagers, you know, might be involved in, in that kind of stuff a little bit more often, or at least with somebody they don't know as well. Um, so spread by saliva, right? Uh, how does it get to the body? Somehow it has to get into your, into your neural, neural or spinal system. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's easier said than done, right? Sometimes people may be a carrier and maybe they, you know, fall off a chair and, uh, you know, it causes a little crack in there. But you know what? Uh, there's little cracks all the time. And uh, so if you have the organism, there's a chance that you might get it. So meningitis, uh, what is meningitis? So it's an itis. So it's an inflammation. It's an inflammation of the meninges. I don't know if I can spell that right. Let's see here. Meninges, I think that's how we spell meninges. That is a kind of a membrane that surrounds your brain and your, your spinal cord, right? Uh, we talked about what other organisms are gram-negative diplococci. That would be Neisseria gonorrhea. And uh, like I said, usually there's the context. Where did you get the organism from? Did you get it from the spinal fluid? Did you get it from uh, the person's genitals? Uh, so that usually tells you which Neisseria that you've had. There are other Neisserias that causes Ill cause illness, by the way. Uh, these two are kind of the big ones. Uh, the other ones are more minor illness. And if you want to look them up, uh, feel free to do so. So it says, what type of follow-up should be done um, regarding the party, right? So hopefully that one's obvious. Okay, um, yeah, we just need to find out, were you, were you kissing anyone else? Uh, who else is at the party? We just want to follow up with, uh, you know, the other teenagers involved to make sure we don't have an outbreak of meningitis here. And the last question, it says, what population or what protection strategies are there for large populations? Uh, probably some of you know there is, some of you know there is a vaccine for meningitis that's given usually as a childhood vaccine. Uh, so this is something that's relatively new, meaning that uh, it's new enough that I didn't get it when I was a baby, and I don't think I've had this vaccine at all. Uh, and, uh, but it, uh, in fact, I have a nephew that had meningitis, and I'm just wondering if he was too old to get it as a routine vaccine. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so probably, I'm guessing most of you are protected against some of the strains. We can't protect against all the strains, but uh, it's good that we have a vaccine for this because uh, the number of cases since this vaccine have come out have, have plummeted uh, quite a bit over the last 20 or 30 years. Okay, so I think that is it for this topic. Let's see where we are with time. We have about 10 minutes left, so that's fine. I think what I will do is start the next topic and uh, maybe it will just be a bit of an introduction. The next topic. So let me just get it ready here. Okay, this is telling me my screen sharing went off. So let's just re, re screen share. There we go.
So topic nine, we're gonna talk about sterilization and disinfection. And uh, so, like I said, these topics here between the midterms, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of moving away from what are the microbes to, you know, what we can do about them, right? And uh, so this topic here, we're gonna talk about sterilization and disinfection, and that is kind of basically trying to kill these things, but in the environment, not in our body. Like, we're not gonna be drinking disinfectants, for example. I hope not, anyway. Uh, Topic 10, we're going to be looking at antimicrobials. So what's going on in the body, how we can control them there. So we're going to start off with some definitions. And uh, so what is sterilization? What is disinfection, right? So sterilization uh, usually is where we're killing everything, right? Uh, so hopefully you're killing everything and, and you want to have things very sterile for things like surgery, or any invasive procedure, it's important that what you have is sterile. Uh, you may notice that it says your prions may be resistant. Remember those proteins that are causing uh, Crotsfield Yakov disease and, and mad cow disease. Uh, sometimes they're not killed using all these procedures. They're very, very tough things to get rid of. So disinfection is where we're not necessarily killing everything we would like to, but in many cases, uh, you know, we're kind of getting most things. So disinfection, usually we're talking with surfaces and disinfectants meaning chemicals. So for example, you might have a disinfectant uh, that you're wiping down a tabletop or a doorknob or something like that. But you know that like after you wipe that thing down, it's exposed to the atmosphere and there may be more germs that are gonna land on it later in the day or maybe within minutes. Uh, so we're hoping we're killing most of the microbes on there. Uh, maybe not going to get everything, but disinfecting is not a bad thing. There's been a lot of disinfecting going along uh, these last few months with the pandemic, of course. You know, I see, uh, uh, I see janitors at the college uh, wiping down doorknobs and, and those kind of things were never done before. And of course, people are always trying to hopefully disinfect their hands as well with disinfectant, uh, hand sanitizer and whatnot. Uh, so a couple other definitions for you as well. Uh, sanitation. Sanitation is usually means we're talking about some sort of procedure done for public places, right? So we sanitize our drinking water, for example. Uh, this is showing a drinking water plant. Uh, the water goes through these processes. Chlorine is added. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sediment is removed, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to go through the pipes. It's going to make it to your house. They can't get rid of 100% of all the microbes. Uh, maybe they can at the plant. Uh, by the time it goes through the pipes and who knows what's in your house, all that, it, you know, but it's going to reduce the numbers greatly so that there shouldn't be any health issues is the whole idea. Uh, utensils in a restaurant is another idea. Uh, you know, if you know anything about industrial uh, dishwashers, they are very hot, much hotter than the dishwasher you have at home. And uh, so the idea is to sanitize things, right, to kind of try to kill as many microbes as possible, but there's no guarantee you'll get rid of all of them. Okay, two more definitions for you. Antisepsis. So antisepsis, you can kind of think of that as, uh, as disinfection, but usually what we're talking about is on the body. So this is a case where, you know, you're going to get, uh, somebody's going to get the flu shot and, uh, you know, they get one of those little alcohol swabs and, you know, they're wiping it on the arm and, you know, they're basically trying to disinfect that little patch of skin before introducing an invasive needle. Uh, Degerming. The germing refers to kind of the just the physical removal of microbes. So a good example of deserming is if uh, let's say you're working at a hospital and somebody walks into the waiting room and vomits on the floor, right? So deserming you're just you're just getting rid of all that stuff because it's going to be full of you know full of a virus or something like that, right? Uh, washing your hands is another good example of deserming. You can imagine you know you're 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 working on something whether it's outside or or you know, maybe a sneeze on your hands, um, there's gonna be mucus and whatnot. And so just kind of getting rid of most of that stuff, mucus or dirt, you're getting rid of a lot of microbes. So we'll see examples of all, all of these things as we go along in this topic. Uh, I know there's only a few minutes left, so uh, I just wanna talk about a few things that kind of uh, uh, um, related to the effectiveness of these, of, these, uh, of these methods. And then next day we'll talk about physical and chemical methods. So how do we kill these things? Well, we, one way to do it is to try to kill their surface areas, right? So the surface of, of many of these organisms is gonna be a membrane. And so if we have chemicals or processes, 
that target membranes, this is good because we're gonna kill them, right? And so you can see here's an example, there's a phospholipid bilayer here. A lot of hand sanitizers have ethanol in them or isopropanol. And the ethanol and isopropanol, it actually gets into the membranes, right? It actually gets in there between the phospholipids and uh, kind of dissolves them a little bit. So this is why hand sanitizers have ethanol in that and anything with a membrane uh, is gonna be susceptible to it. So hand sanitizers are really good for enveloped viruses and not good for non-enveloped viruses, by the way. Uh, this is also kind of what happens when people drink too much ethanol is it gets in and it's affecting their membranes and their nerves, which is why people have slower responses and why people shouldn't be uh, you know, consuming it and, uh, and driving, of course. So we can destroy membranes. We can also destroy proteins. Uh, so proteins, many proteins are enzymes, allowing them to metabolize and live. And if we can destroy their proteins, then we can destroy the, the organisms. We can do this by heat or chemicals or a variety of other methods. And you can see what's going on as the protein there is in its normal shape and it's getting destroyed or denatured. Uh, we can also destroy nucleic acids. So the classical way to destroy nucleic acids is using uh, some sort of radiation, such as UV light, as UV sterilization methods. So all of these things we'll see examples of. Uh, like I said, next day, I figured I would just spend a few minutes kind of introducing them and then we'll re-talk about the next day. So how effective are these things? Uh, partly it depends on the organism you're dealing with. So as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, prions are super resistant and very hard to kill. Endospores in bacteria, very hard to kill. They're designed to be resistant dormant structures. So you can see there's a whole bunch of different things in there, right? So cysts of protozoa are tough. They're not as tough as endospores. Uh, mycobacteria, that's tuberculosis, has that waxy coat on it. These are tough things, right? At the bottom of the list, you can see we have envelope viruses. These things are really fragile. So something like HIV does not survive outside of the human body or, or fluids very easily at all. It's, it's enveloped, it's very fragile. Um, Coronaviruses, uh, same thing, relatively fragile. Sometimes they get protected by mucus. So you may have seen there was a new study talking about how long it can survive out in the environment. And if there's mucus, uh, sometimes that protects it, you know, it keeps it hydrated and whatnot. So it can last for a few days uh, within the mucus. But generally, envelope viruses are a lot easier to destroy because they have that delicate uh, phospholipid bilayer on the outside. Also, number of microbes. Hopefully that one's obvious. If you have a huge amount of uh, viruses coating something, it's gonna be harder to kill them all, right? Somebody vomits on the floor in the waiting room, that's a good example. Uh, it's just gonna be a massive amount of, of uh, pathogen there, right? So it's gonna be harder to deal with. Uh, the environment is gonna have a big difference too, right? You know, the humidity, um, some things respond better or worse to dryness. Uh, presence of, uh, of bodily fluids, uh, you know, vomit, mucus, etc. All those kind of things are going to help or hinder the uh, disinfection process. And then exposure time, right? The longer you treat something, the better chances you're going to kill it. So if you're heat sterilizing something, the more heat and the longer that you expose the heat, the more likely you're going to kill uh, endospores, for example. Okay, so I'm going to come back to C. diff in a moment. Um, maybe I'll come back to C. diff next day. This is an organism we're going to talk about that's really tough. It's called Clostridium difficile. Difficile is French for difficult. So this is difficult to kill. It's an organism that makes endospores. Uh, like I said, we'll come back to that next day. Uh, just want to finish off in this slide and say, what are we going to be talking about? Uh, the good news about this unit is many of these things you've seen before somewhere. You just may not have noticed it. Uh, we can kill things by heat, so high temperatures. Uh, low temperatures, we're not usually killing things, but we might be preserving things. We can filter things. We can uh, add salt to things. We can add radiation to things. So all these things are, are, are techniques that have been used somewhere. Some of them are a lot more important medically. Uh, some of them are more important for like, let's say the food industry, right? And the food industry has the same issues. They want to try to control growth. They don't want, they don't want mold and fungi on things, right? So these are some of the things we're gonna be talking about. Uh, part B of this particular topic uh, is going to be uh, chemical methods of microbial control. So we're going to talk about some different chemicals. And same thing, many of those chemicals you've probably seen somewhere before. You just didn't know it. Like Mr. Clean, for example. Mr. Clean is a phenolic chemical. And so we're going to be talking about some of those things. 
Okay, so it looks like we're out of time and that's fine. We're about where I want it to be. Uh, so hopefully everybody has a wonderful Tuesday and uh, have a great day.